Hey guys, welcome back to our Warrior series. We're gonna have. Ooh, let me just get right in the frame. Uh, we're gonna have some good fun here. Uh, we're right now ten and two. Two more games. Let's do it. Let's uh, let's crush some people. Oh, I will crush you. So it's uh, eight out of eight role playing when playing the warrior. All right, let's go with the mulligan here. Uh, pause it for a second. So right now. We haven't really coined out yet, right? We've been we've been fairly um, slow in terms of using the coin. Usually, we've been coining a four drop if we've been coining, right? We've been skipping turn one, playing a two drop, then coining uh, coining our four because our curve kind of promotes that. Our curve doesn't have a lot of three drops. That's why we rather skip turn three. But against the priest, I think it's really, really, really important that you're the one that's on the board first because. If you're the one that's on the board first, that means you get to dictate the trades. That means he doesn't get to use Shrinkmeister to his advantage. He doesn't get to uh, use Valens and attack with it straight away. He doesn't get to power with shield and attack with it straight away. So um, against priests, it's it's very important that you're the one dictating the trades. And that's why I'm going to be mulliganing slightly more aggressive here. And I'm going to keep River Croc and Slam. And my thought process here was that if I keep the River Croc and I coin it out and our opponent plays, say, a Shrinkmeister, I can slam it, kill it, and I'll still have the initiative. If he plays a River Croc himself, I'll still slam it, kill it, my River Croc will stay alive and I'll draw a card. So that was kind of the reasoning here for the slightly more aggressive uh, keep and using our coin to coin out a 2-drop rather than to skip our turn 3 and coin out a 4-drop instead. Uh, so yeah, we'll see here we take the aggressive route. So we'll see what our opponent plays, and then we can deal with it fairly fairly easily normally. Uh, Gilblin Stalker would be annoying because it's a stealth, but he skips his turn as well. So now, you know, you look a little bit silly for making that move, but, you know, better safe than sorry. If we're both skipping our turn, it's really not that uh, disastrous, because I'm the one that, you know, already has a minion on the table. So in, in the grand scheme of things, I come out slightly ahead, I feel. Uh, all right, so our opponent plays a Dark Cultist. It's kind of a um, weird scenario. At first, I was thinking, hmm, I have to slam and execute that and then keep a guy on the board. Like, you don't want to let Dark Cultist live. Um, that's that's basically unacceptable. But now that I drew the Warbot, it's better to trade and play the Warbot, save the execute, because now you still have something on the table. You have the Warbot, it's only one power less, and you get to keep, you get to keep that execute, so it, it was worth it. Because if he had played a Yeti or a Tazdingo or whatever with 5 HP, I couldn't have killed it anyway with Weapon Smith and my River Croc. And there's a Yeti, so... Alright, for this turn, it's kind of an awkward turn because we can't deal with this... Okay, so this is actually a good, a good turn to analyze because I think a lot of people here would have hit in, execute this guy and then play the Fairy Dragon, right? That feels a bit more natural, you're cleaning up the board. Uh, against Priest, that's always a decent thing, cleaning up the board. But that means that next turn he's just going to play a 5-drop and you are going to be in that same scenario. You are still going to have a weak board and you're not even going to be able to deal with this uh, board very well. You'll just have a Fairy Dragon versus a 5-drop and you know you don't have your Execute anymore, so you'll just be in the same scenario. So this is a turn where we have to say, okay, I'm just going to develop rather than deal with your board. And the best way, according to me, here is to play your Weaponsmith and then use your face into the Eddy to damage it so he can't kill the Weaponsmith for free. You might say, Shady, but then he can heal and do it anyway. Uh, yes, that's true, but first of all, heal is 2 mana, so maybe he doesn't want to spend the mana. And uh, second of all, if he heals it, then I can still kill it back with my face. Yes, I take 8 damage, but, you know, playing a weapon class, you have to man up. I always say that. You, you can't be a pussy when you are playing rogue or warrior, you know, like, this is, this is what your uh, class does. You take face damage in the early game with weapons. If you're not gonna do it, then you might as well not play a weapon class, right? You can sit back with your fire blast as a mage or just uh, use uh, spells with a different class. But if you play a weapon class, you gotta man up, you gotta, you gotta take the damage early. So he plays the Dark Cultist here, and then he's gonna heal the Yeti and free kill the Warbot. Which is actually fine. Ooh, sorry guys. Ooh. So right now, because of that, he doesn't know that we have Execute, of course, but 
the way how he traded makes it really nicely for our execute. And the only reason he traded like that is because we swung preemptively with our face. So I feel like we really, we forced this scenario. We forced this on him. Uh, Dread Corsair here seems like a no-brainer. Two mana for a 3-3, three, three, that's, that's pretty decent. And then we can just uh, Heroic Strike our face, use our face on the Dark Cultist. Then he gets a really big Yeti, but then we can still just execute it. So here we are, we are kind of glad that we saved that execute. Uh, for a timer, we can just use it very, uh, very nicely here. Like our opponent now probably thinks like, Oh my god, he's such a noob, he gives me a big yeti. No, like, nope, sorry sir, execute. And then three phase. So right now, I don't feel super far ahead. I don't think that we're in a super comfortable position. Uh, but then our opponent does something very peculiar. Uh, something that I always say, don't do this guys. Don't play Venture Co Mercenary. And I'll show you exactly why, right? This is, this is one of the things that I keep hammering on. Like, try not to draft this card. And if you draft it, draft it in something very spell heavy. Draft it in mage, draft it maybe in a druid where you have a ton of wraths and swipes. But as a priest, I don't know, you need to get your minions down, you need to get your temple enforcer, your dark cultists, your shrink meisters. So, I mean, whenever I see Venchico, I'm ignoring that. Like, like you can see that straight away I'm going face. I'm saying, like, no, I mean I will I refuse to do with Venchico because his the handicap that the Venchico brings on the table is so immense it's like three mana every turn so the longer that Venchico lives the more our opponent's mana curve gets uh, gets screwed and the the worse that minion becomes so in the very best case scenario this trades immediately but obviously we're not going to give that trade to him that would be very bad and to play a bit around Holy Nova it's better to play the Corcoran Elite and the Fairy Dragon and just to go face more if you play the, sorry guys, uh, if you play the Reckless Rocketeer, uh, she dies to Holy Nova, you can hit into one and then Holy Nova, so it's not so good. Here I was really thinking whether I wanted to play into Mind Control Tech, because Mind Control Tech is a card, it's very annoying. This is uh, pre-TGT, so the card pool hadn't been expanded yet, and Mind Control Tech was slightly more common than, uh, than we have it right now. So, but in the end, I, I come to the conclusion that it's um, it's better to not play around it and have more chance to lethal him rather than uh, play around the phantom cards. Uh, you know we don't know whether he has it or not, so it's you know it's no ways. And now he, he just divine spirits his ventrico, which is so weird to me. I mean, I, I see this move and I'm like, okay, you want to keep that alive? Sure, go for it. All right, and here we've got six. 450. We're one damage of lethal here. It's unfortunate. We are one damage or one mana of lethal. But we'll use the weapon uh, instead of a minion. Uh, simply because the weapon can attack now and then again next turn. So you want to get that full damage of the Arcanine Reaper in there. It's also something he can't really mess with that easily. He would need an Ooze or a Harrison. So you can see how this game was actually fairly close. I would say that the Priest was ahead. And then he played Ventrico and he just flat out lost. So that's why I always say, try not to draft Venture Co. If you are playing against an experienced player, he will punish you so hard for playing that minion. It's just like, ignore it, play a small taunt. I mean, Annoyatron versus Venture Co. Super, super effective. So, yeah. Um, I hope the point is clear. Uh, Venture Co. loses you games. Now, not to say that it will never do something good. If you have enough mana and you don't have that many cards in your hand, yeah, Venture Co. is fine. Um, I mean... If you have a Venchico, a Wisp, and a Goldshire Footman, you'll probably still draft a Venchico. But just saying that if there is a realistic alternative, try not to pick Venchico because you'll just have defeats where this happens, where your opponent just goes, oh, that's a nice Venchico you got there. I'm just going to hit your face now and you're going to die because you can't play anything else. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. And yeah, I will see you tomorrow for the final game, guys. Get your Shady Diggies ready. Let's dig for the, for the 12 wins. All right, I'll see you then.